Thank you, Peter. My name's Natalie, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm an undergraduate in the UCLA Design Media Arts Department. And I proposed uh, having Emily come talk because I'm a big fan of their work. I find it incredibly important. And um, I also think that uh, we, it's really important that we have discussions about the design of disabled accessibility. And I think it often gets left out of larger discussions of design. And I think it's a matter of real urgency and necessity and something that we as designers have such a huge responsibility to consider. I think this time when we're engaging with remote education is a great time to consider how we can promote more accessibility within our department, especially digitally. And um, I'm really excited to say that for this talk, we were able to have, uh, we have Lynn here who's captioning and making this talk more accessible, which I think is really exciting. So thank you so much for the support from the faculty in making that happen and in supporting this talk and everyone for showing interest in this subject that means a lot to me as a disabled student and thank you so much emily for being here i'm super excited to hear what you have to say i've learned so much from you over our relationship so thank you thank you babe i really appreciate it and i love you dearly um i'm not very formal uh, so I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, my name is Emily Barker and I went to the School of the Art Institute. Well, I guess I first went to RISD pre-college and thankfully decided that the hills were too high for me to walk up with a canvas and with the amount, the large works that I was making, even as like a 17 year old, it was just too much work, which is, great because I ended up in a wheelchair um, my sophomore year, the summer after my sophomore year of school after getting into the advanced painting department. Um, SAIC was pretty inaccessible like most uh, academic institutions and did not make the physical accommodations that I needed. So even though they tout all of my accomplishments now, uh, I actually didn't finish two classes there and I did not graduate because I refused to. Um, I do not support them as an academic institution if they were not going to support my disabled body while I was attending uh, that school. And I find it really a shame that a lot of wheelchair users do not have access to get into most academic institutions physically. Um, I even work, I even made my most recent show mostly at the UCLA uh, Architecture Studios. And I could not use the restroom on the floor in which we were uh, making the works. So it's pretty interesting to, uh, get visibility in this way, but also uh, know that these institutions like um, uh, CalArts have been sued by personal friends of mine so that they could have access to the restrooms at those schools and are yet still denied access. Um, one of my favorite artists, Jacqueline Romine, is a very dear friend of mine and you should all check out her work as well. Um, it is all about the inaccessibility in the art world uh, currently today and uh, Jacqueline has a car which I do not have and that gives them the ability to go to the different and sit their chair um, up into the art galleries that they cannot get into. Um, and world, we are not able to get into a lot of places, restaurants, stores that my friends sell clothes at, um, galleries, uh, movie theaters, like very simple things you would think would be accessible or really not. And uh, so that leads me to my whole body of work. I was initially a painter before becoming disabled, but uh, you know, I was too close to Felix Gonzalez Torres pieces at SAIC in the museum to uh, not be influenced by the dialogue that you can have as an artist um, talking about the current state of things maybe not in a way where you're demanding uh, political action, but you're just kind of nudging people. I mean, I am demanding political action, but in a way where it's more of like a forced, um, like a forced experience or a forced um, perspective of like what my life is like and other people 
lives are like, like mine. Um, and to ask if we really want to live in a world that's like this. I was able-bodied for most of my life. Uh, and now a third of it, I've been in a wheelchair and it's shocking. It's truly shocking. And it's not just a shame that I'm in a wheelchair. That's fine. But it's a shame that people don't decide to make the very easy, necessary changes to give me and other people like me the ability to get into spaces with them. Um, which leads me to my first body of work. Uh, I will uh, kindly ask that all academic institutions and all people that go into making um, space decide to do it in a way that uh, creates equity for those of us who are disabled um, and think about our bodies in space. And now I will share my screen. So let's get out of here. Um, I'm going to share my whole screen. Can you guys see this? Yes, good. Awesome. This is my most recent project, but I'm going to take you back to the beginning. We're going to work backwards. This is my email. This is a uh, young thug holding uh, Nilla wafers in a wheelchair, which is a constant mood for me. Um, this piece is uh, 120 catheters on the wall, um, hospital catheters, ones that I had used in the hospital. Well, not These were not used catheters, but the same type that I had used in the hospital. And this is just uh, like 20 days worth of waste that would be created from using uh, a device that enables people with spinal cord injuries to use the restroom. Um, I think that they're beautiful, personally. Uh, and I think we need to normalize other people's bodies. And I think that this is a good way of doing that. I think we need to stop um, idolizing this idea of what is normal. And we need to embrace each other's differences in a very real personal kind of way. Um, without doing so, we will never live in a world in which, you know, we will all exist peacefully um, and or have the same ability to uh, engage and create and exist. Um, but it's just interesting, something so personal uh, is not something most people see every day or have had to ever look at. Um, but I think that even something like medical objects that are shocking, in a sense, can be quite, um, quite lovely to look at. Um, these are my Rojo cushions. This body of work was produced like recently after my accident. Um, and I was just amazed by these, uh, by the like kind of visual um, like nature of these. They all looked like sculptures that I would have created in, in class, but they're all very real objects that would break, um, that I would go through. All of these were popped Rojo cushions. They're a NASA produced technology. They're $500 each and they keep, um, they're life-saving basically. They keep me from getting pressure sores and um, getting bad infections to the point of which I would die like um, Christopher Reeves did. He died of a pressure sore that was badly infected because he was antibiotic resistant from having too many infections from using catheters and um, from getting pressure sores and uh, died of neglect actually. He was like not being properly taken care of. So even the best of us with foundations um, are at the whims of other people constantly in a very physical way. Um, I have a lot more. Well, why is this so small? Dang it, that's not the not the image I want. We can actually go to uh, we can go to let collectives. I had a little. Um, do 
this way I like showing people the links and stuff this way you guys can find everything that I'm showing you because it's all online um, this is a collective by my friend Haley Cranberry who showcases a lot of disabled artists people I personally know these people um my works are on it this is an up close image um my first you know few years in a being chronically ill and having crps uh were very interesting um very painful um but pretty enlightening and uh i just was kind of like taken by these objects and also the fact that uh this is some of the most expensive art i've ever made my time in the hospital having 20 odd surgeries i've been hospitalized for like two and a half years total of my life now um is over like a million point five hundred thousand dollars um i don't pay back my medical debt as of right now because i can't um even with insurance you are left with like crazy amounts to cover um personally that would never that i could i could never afford to do um and so i like people to think about um kind of like the realities that those of us who have had accidents are forced to um confront and deal with as 19 year olds on our own um, and to question whether or not these systems work for us. Uh, they are very oppressive and they're very predatory. And I think we should all work to uh, provide each other with some form of health justice because it can happen to you at any moment. And uh, it doesn't make any sense to uh, penalize people for having a body that is fragile. We all are born with the same sort of. Uh, bodies that need tending to and need care. Um, this was my next proposal for a show because uh, I, I do not have access to even most things in my house are pretty inaccessible um, and that creates a lot of barriers for me every day. So I designed a house that I was going to show at Murmur's Gallery. It was my first proposal. Um, a dear friend of mine, Morgan Ella Elder curated the show, um, has had personal interest in my work since I was in advanced painting with her at SAIC um, and has influenced me and I would consider has been a big part in having um, access intimacy has always been present with um, my access needs and not making me feel like a burden uh, at school and in the art world and showing up to her house gallery and would and like that is very nice. Um, but I designed this house to confront the sort of realities that wheelchair users face on a daily basis with not having um, independence within their own homes. However, I couldn't show people that because you wouldn't understand what is so inaccessible about um, a house without experiencing it for yourself at my scale. So my show changed to i i got a new idea and i am i was like i need to start with um showing people forcing a perspective on people of what it feels like to be at my level in space um this piece uh to the left is like mm, 20 feet tall the countertops, the kitchen countertops would come up to and the average height, a person who's like five eight five nine, um, would come up to their chest bone. So as you can imagine, you can't do most things in a kitchen if your chest is at the countertops. And if you can't step on a step stool, you can't wash your dishes, you can't put away your dishes, you can't cook. Um, and so that creates 
a need for a caretaker um, creates a need for those needs to be, those basic needs to be met due to a design flaw and due to the inability disabled people. I don't qualify for actual disability in the United States. I live off of SSI because my accident happened when I was too young basically to have been able to pay into the social security system long enough to actually qualify for disability in the US. So I don't know a single person that could afford to buy or renovate a home on $730 a month. So we are forced to pay for services like renting an apartment that don't work for us and that create barriers for us on a daily basis. And so whether that apartment has um, you know, a standardized kitchen of 36 inches tall, that is no longer a functional functional object for me that becomes a an art object as useful as this this one is um and i think the space kind of creates uh like walking through it for people i heard that they just had never thought about the ways in which standardization in design and architecture would be oppressive for other people and it's really interesting because kitchens were originally uh, made for the average height of a woman in the US uh, in order to cook, but then they changed that with um, industrialization and it became uh, 36 inches tall and as opposed to 31 inches tall, which would work for me even. Um, and, you know, that is just a dude making kitchen countertops that work for him at the expense of everyone else. Um, or, you know, and a cis hetero male of like a tall, tall, pretty tall stature making um, kitchens and standardized kitchen heights. Um, I wish, there it is. Uh, I cannot roll through any sort of textured surface, whether that is sand. I've only been to the beach twice with um, out and a, a specific wheelchair that you can rent out at Venice. If you're a wheelchair user, you should definitely go try that out. Um, but any sort of textured floor, I cannot get through, whether that's dirt, gravel, carpet. Um, it's very, very difficult to push 170 pounds with your arms plus a textured surface. So I created this rug that's six feet by four feet um, to for people to walk through to kind of experience um, the the same sort of obstacle that I do on a textured surface and it's made out of IV tubing and copper wire. Um, I was really inspired by Hephaestus, the Greek god of a sculpture who is also the, the lamed god um, cast out of the heavens by his mother. I really relate to that character a little bit. Um, this is like a close up of the tubing and the copper wires. Um, you know, copper is like this earth metal that is, is very conductive. And I feel like disabled people in Crip Wisdom really need to have a sort of electricity in order to be able to navigate the austerity measures placed upon us by the bureaucracy of the different systems and different um, countries we inhabit because we are not given the same privileges of going about our lives in a carefree, carefree way that able-bodied people are during this pandemic. Um, a lot of my friends have paralyzed lungs that would not be able to survive COVID. I struggled to battle COVID in February and I was sick for two months and I could not move and I could not breathe. Um, so I used a lot of crip wisdom in knowing what to take as a chronically ill immunocompromised person to get myself out of that and having the right care at the right time that I usually don't have and I'm very grateful to have gone through that experience, but um, it is a lot of disabled people have um, died in group homes and that is where I was told I should be due to my chronic illnesses and due to my disability, that I should not be living in a regular apartment because it was too, um, because I couldn't find really one to live in. My current apartment I, is not accessible, um, easily, like without help. Uh, and I was told to live in a group home. And uh, recently, most people who are disabled in group homes 
a large percentage of them have passed away due to coronavirus. Um, and that's a pretty brutal reality to face. And I think we need to really question whether or not um, we want to participate in uh, systems like that because disabled people have a lot of uh, intersecting um, things on top of just what you see or what they present as to you. They're often dealing with a lot more or have um, other uh, chronic illnesses or or things that they have to deal with that are very personal. So there's a reason why this stuff is like so taboo, but I would like to normalize a lot of it in order to um, ask for the care that we need as disabled people in the US to be able to receive it. These are my um, grabbers. Uh, they're copper casted iron oxide grabbers um, made of casts of grabbers that I use in my house. Um, this is the only object I have to navigate the built environment are these, uh, are these grabbers. Um, and so I thought it was very important to create a relic of them because I would like to live in a world in which I do not have to navigate um, the built environment with just one tool that is um, not very, not incredibly useful for all objects. Um, and so I made two of them. There's one in both rooms of my house um, hanging on the wall similarly to the way that you see here that I use every day and I'm hoping that I am able to build a world in which I do not have to use them any longer and um, they become a part of my past and other disabled people's past. Um, this piece is called At My Limit. Um, I, after my seventh spine surgery, I can no longer pick up anything heavier than 20 pounds, lest my, um, screws pop out of my sacrum. So this is kind of like, I was a very, uh, even as a wheelchair user, pretty brutal on my body on a daily basis. I was throwing my chair in and out of my Camry. I was building a lot of stuff. I was, I was shoveling my wheelchair, um, I was shoveling paths through the snow in Chicago to get to school, to get to my car, to get to school in the morning. Um, I was pretty harsh on my body, not knowing that having a um, spine held together by two rods is not a very, um, I thought titanium was strong, but the problem is that when they screw the rods into your back, you can pull them loose by making the wrong movements. So I made those movements too many times and met my limit, um, which is now I can't pick up anything that's heavier than, um, they really don't want me picking up anything that's heavier than a gallon of milk, but uh, 20 pounds is kind of like what I decided. Um, this is a cast of my hand. You can move it. It's a 3D printed cast. Um, and this is like a robotic arm, kind of like rusted, the way that my arm has like rusted from overuse. The most common surgery for paraplegics who use wheelchairs um, is having to have our rotator cuffs replaced so I can look forward to that surgery eventually. Um, this is a ramp which is an immortalized object for uh, most people think that ramps are the most accessible forms of navigating space for wheelchair users. However, if you have had a certain amount of surgeries or are not strong enough and you only qualify for a manual wheelchair with your insurance, ramps kind of are also an obstacle to overcome and people do not build ramps in a way in which they can be navigated easily. For most disabled people, um, I struggle on my slight incline driveway and can no longer get up that without help um, due to the texture of the driveway and the cracks in it. Um, and this is one of my first wheelchairs that broke down due, due to overuse um, and rusted out due to use in Chicago. It only took three years for it to fall apart. Um, and people think that these objects are sturdy and that they're useful and they're really not. They're created by able-bodied people as like kind of like band-aids for uh, 
for larger issues that don't need to exist, which I would argue after being to different countries that we should have lifts and that we should build things flat because we can and because they have to level the ground anyway to build anything else there. Um, they just decide not to make it accessible and it's not a priority. Um, this was all vacuum formed. The kitchen was also vacuum formed at UCLA. Um, so all of these panels were vacuum formed in this in the um, architecture labs at UCLA with the help of my collaborator Tomas Jan Groza, who I love dearly and who I hope is here with us. Um, Tomas helped me with the renderings and with the building of this particular sculpture and was an invaluable resource uh, to help make my ideas come to life. Uh, and yeah, I think a really big part of disabled artists being able to make work is having a good team and having support systems that exist. And I'm really lucky to have those sometimes uh, to do these types of things. Uh, this is a closet rod with a hanger on it uh, that sat um, just out of reach for my father in the gallery, who's six seven. Um, I cannot use my closet and I cannot move my closet rod as easily as you can with these because it's a built-in so I would have to demo my whole closet to um, make it accessible for me so I actually have to ask for help every time I'm getting dressed uh, in order to just reach the clothes which as someone who has a fest tool drill and enjoys building things is pretty freaking ridiculous um, that we do not just have lower closet rods uh, you know for sure people, for all of us, and that those things aren't thought about when building apartments. Um, this is a nightlight that uh, belonged to my grandmother, and I, uh, she left it at my house, and um, her wisdom, along with the wisdom of like all of the other disability advocates and artists who have come before me, is my one small hope, glimmer of hope, um, that we can change things and make them uh, more useful and uh, give people more freedoms than we currently do under the current systems that we have and under the current um, ridiculous economic structures that we have and obviously are so brittle as we found out recently. Um, but disabled people have known those things for a long time. This is a text piece that kind of gets into things that I, I have a personal experience, but um, of being a wheelchair user and having the worst pain disease in the world. Um, but there are lots of different needs that need to be met, not even needs, but a lot of different things that need to be thought about for people who are blind, people who are hard of hearing, um, for people who are just short, for people who are really tall, <laughs> even like most just, because of norms, anyone who fits outside of those norms, due to like a eugenics-based uh, culture, we do not have space built for us. And so we meet obstacles every day. And I think we really need to eradicate the idea of normal because uh, this piece goes into it. But um, it's blurred because it's supposed to create the same sort of um, effect that one who is, uh, you know, everything is a spectrum. Uh, people with spinal cord injuries live on a spectrum. People who are visually impaired lived on, live on a spectrum. It's not like this dramatized thing always of which you just have, you know, just totally can't see anything, but it is blurred. So I try to create that obstacle in this piece. I also spend $500 every year on contacts and glasses because I'm like nearly, um, I am almost blind, but I'm not legally blind quite yet. Um, and so I'm trying to, I think it's ridiculous that I should have to pay to be able to see like other, that that when most people can, I think it's ridiculous that I should have to pay for a wheelchair when most people can walk. I think that it's ridiculous that people should have to pay for caregivers if they need help getting out of bed in the morning. Um, we will all get there someday. And I think we need to create systems that 
uh, account for these things. So this piece is, imagine waking up and not being able to enter your home or your friend's home and your family's home or the bathrooms in those spaces. Imagine finding a place you can enter and use the bathroom, but not being able to use your kitchen, your dryer, your closet. Imagine not being able to use most bathrooms or see yourself in the bathroom mirrors and the bathrooms you can use. Imagine not being able to be to physically open the door of your home or apartment building and having to wait an hour for someone to let you in. Imagine sunlight and fluorescent lighting immediately giving you a searing headache. Imagine not being able to use the sidewalk or get up your own driveway. Imagine needing someone to get you out of bed in the morning and if they don't show, not being able to get up and out of bed. Imagine if you have the use of your hands, needing a grabber in every room to pick up every little thing. Imagine someone moving an object from where you placed it and it never being found again. Imagine an obstacle, imagine an obstacle created in the design of every object built into existence. Imagine a hierarchy of needs and yours never being met. Imagine going in and out of the ER in every hospital in your city. Imagine going months vomiting and being too tired to move, not knowing you could have died any day due to lack of salt in your blood. Imagine having to get surgeries on all of your toes to be able to wear shoes. Imagine spending the majority of your time on hold being passed around to different departments whose jobs it seems is to deny you the services you pay for. Death by a million paper cuts. Imagine being loved. Imagine space being built for you. Imagine being a light to those around you. Imagine being a force to be reckoned with. Imagine industrialization, not stripping every, each object of use value because they say your body has none. Um, I'm a firm believer in um, disability as a social construct. I do not think that disability would exist if we created a world and that accounted for our needs, like we account for able-bodied people's needs. And that leads me to this piece. Um, this is a stack of my medical bills from the first few months after my accident. Uh, we didn't actually print all of them because it would tip over and uh, the paper was kind of expensive to print all of that. So I just printed what I thought would be pretty shocking. But this is like just the first few months of billing <laughs> paperwork. So the first page of this was like, um, was over $60,000 in the first few hours after my accident, um, which is ridiculous. I mean, I'm 19 years old. I'm like a kid that like is now dealing with this bureaucracy and dealing with the weight of the financial burden of a body that is uh, all of a sudden uh, very, 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 very marginalized and um, not accounted for and erased, historically has been erased from history, from discussions, from uh, textbooks and from space, um, really erased from space. Uh, and I would like disability to no longer be a fringe topic of uh, discussion for something that we should work towards. Um, you know, eradicating disability wouldn't exist if space was built for us. Um, and if our if we had the proper help that we need, we as a society understand that babies need help and that they need someone to put them to bed and take care of their bowel and bladder movements and feed them. But as soon as a human, as, as soon as an adult who is decidedly old enough to do those things for themselves cannot for whatever reason, we decide that it is no longer of value for us to take care of them. And why is that? Um, why do we not give that same care to other people that we do to children? We understand that they need it, but for some reason we decide they don't deserve it. Um, yeah, and that leads me to my more hopeful project. Uh, this is my experience, but, um, you know, I'm tired of listening to being the, there's a sound piece that plays in this room that is uh, opus number one, and it's a hold tone used in like all insurance companies. And it's what I literally was listening to all of, all of uh, earlier today, and uh, I'm I'm tired of of having to deal with these systems. And I'm lucky; like I have the use of my arms. I have a lot of privilege in the ways in which I'm able to fight for my access needs. I'm able to advocate for myself. I have a kind of bad attitude about these things that enables me to meet needs that other people may not have access to. 
um, or who are too sick to be able to fight for. And uh, I think it's important that we give disabled people that ability to uh, advocate for their needs without being a burden on um, what we decide is like normal or what we're willing to accommodate for um, because it could happen to you. And it will, I mean, everyone will either, you know, get in a car accident and die or will age into disability. So why not live in a world in which we account for those things? Seems a little nearsighted not to. Um, in order to uh, facilitate my ability to keep living and to have uh, shelter uh, after Corona and uh, after, you know, roommates not, you know, losing their jobs, like no one can pay rent right now. Um, I cannot pay rent for my entire apartment that's inaccessible for me to live in. So I started this uh, project that is a extension of my practice and it's designing a space that is completely accessible for me and showing people that it does not have to be expensive. It does not have to be fancy. It does not have to be, um, take up a lot of work. Uh, it is design and design is free. Um, design is an idea. Design is problem solving. So this is a 36 by eight foot RV. Um, it is a standard toy hauler that has a ramp behind the bed that folds down right here. And I'll be able to make a, make it an extra gentle slope so that I don't have issues getting into the trailer at all. Um, and it'll have a sliding door. And this bed is on electrical jack called a happy jack that goes up and down off the ground to give added space to do, you know, physical therapy under during the day. The, top down view is a little bit shows the amount of space that I would have to do like physical therapy under the bed and um, this would be my closet this whole project is under sixteen thousand dollars it was like all it was all fundraiser money that I was supposed to be able to use to get an electric wheelchair that was not covered by my insurance and an accessible vehicle but I couldn't raise enough money to be able to get both and you can't have an, a, a 175 pound electric wheelchair without also having a wheelchair accessible vehicle if you need to get to and from doctor's appointments and your caregivers don't have $60,000 accessible vehicles because that's the cost of a, a van. So I used the money that I had left over from buying my current um, wheelchair that is like just a regular, like the ones I've always had, um, that I need to stop using for the sake of my back to buy this RV that was a used toy hauler. And it's all, I'm literally treating the plywood outside right now, but it's 18 sheets of um, quarter inch ply for the floors and the walls and it's all treated and we're, um, I'm, doing like better insulation and it will all be uh, solar. All the energy is like solar based and the entire interior is fully wheelchair accessible in a, you know, very, very small limited amount of space. So I kind of want to demolish the stereotypes that we have about accessibility being um, either too expensive to accommodate and or too much work to accommodate. Because if I can do it with a team of people, anyone can do it, especially if they're an organization that has as much funding as any academic institution does in the United States currently. Um, this space utilizes pocket doors so that the access to the bathtub and the um, sink is not blocked by swinging doors. Um, the countertop is to my height, which is 29 inches, and I can pull up under the countertop and the sink to brush my teeth and wash my face, which I currently can't do. When I currently go to wash my face or brush my teeth, I'm breaking my spinal precautions, and I'm often just spitting toothpaste onto the countertop because I cannot reach my face up over the sink. Um, the bathtub is amazing because it has a, what's called a sliding board built in where I will be able to sit to shower. The shower head will actually come sideways out and there will be a handheld one 
for me to use to be able to sit there or transfer into the bathtub because it'll be a two-step um, uh, bench. Um, I don't know if many people know this, but there aren't accessible apartments. I've been looking to move for now. I've been here for three years to find an apartment that is more wheelchair accessible just for getting into the actual space itself. And they don't exist. Like they don't exist at all. They, if you can get into a building, you can't get into the bathroom and shut the door. If you can get into a building, you can't get into the kitchen and turn around. Um, and not under the amount of money that I'm currently set to live off of in any state. Um, it just does not exist. It didn't exist in Chicago, didn't exist in Georgia. And so now I'm building it for myself so that I can be able to continue on with my practice of, of making works and um, not be constantly faced with the, with the burden of living in a house that's not built for me and without having the capital necessary to buy a house to renovate which is you know financially impossible for most disabled people unless their parents have money um and that is just like not the case for most for 99 percent of us uh we are the least employed uh we have the most expensive cost of living and we are not able to access basic needs like um caregiving um the ability to pay for bills, um, medical bills, uh, access to physical space in the way that we need it. So my toilet will be behind this sliding door. This is like the bookshelf right here. The toilet will be under a bench that is kind of like a, uh, like a reclining sofa that folds down off the wall. This is a, what's called a sliding pocket in an RV. Um, and the toilet will be a composting toilet so that I do not create waste in my living space, which is very important to me as someone who is already creating a lot of waste with the plastic that I have to throw out in order to live. Um, I do not want to hook up to a sewer system. I think we should all be taking accountability more for our bodies in space. And this is someone that needs a lot of care for their body in space. Um, this is a dinette that already comes in the RV, but I think it's really cute. Um, so that will be saying this is a little wood burning stove because I cannot lift the propane stove, but I can lift little pieces of kindling firewood um, and make little fires to heat the space. They actually work really well and they keep um, the space very dry so that you never have like mold or rot. Um, this is a sink. There's plenty of countertop space. There will be a dishwasher here. Um, there will be a stove and, a, and an oven under there. And everything will be built for my height. So all of the countertops will be 30 inches tall. And I will be able to wash my dishes for the first time um, and not pay someone $20 or $17 an hour plus like gas or whatever to run errands, which often works to like $20 an hour to wash my dishes. Um, this will be my pantry and it's very simple, but I think that every disabled person deserves <laughs> something that is built for them. Um, this is just 270 square feet and this was in the only budget that I had from extra fundraising money for a accessible vehicle and a Omeo wheelchair. Uh, I recently, uh, again, once again, was catapulted with my chair due to the Los Angeles sidewalk. So I can't even I can't even sue the city to make the sidewalks accessible due to a class action lawsuit. So if I can't sue the city to make it accessible, if I can't demand accessibility from uh, you know queer gyms in my neighborhood. Uh, if I cannot demand accessibility from the institutions and uh, from the schools that I would wish to attend in this city, if I cannot demand accessibility from the restaurants, I have to create it. So I want to create it in a way that uh, makes everyone pretty jealous and uh, shows them that there's no reason for them not to be and it's quite selfish for them not to be. and. Uh, yeah, that it's not a cost barrier. I'm very tired of excuses. Uh, and 
I want to make a accessible artist residency. I can't attend any artist residencies because I'm also a wheelchair user, which is uh, quite upsetting. Uh, so this space will eventually be turned into an accessible artist residency once I'm able to build a larger space for myself, like an earthship tw type dwelling, very low cost, very high R value um, on a piece of property somewhere in like an hour out from LA because I still have to be close enough for doctor's appointments. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping that... Uh, not hoping this will become an artist residency so that other disabled people are given, especially like wheelchair users who live in a segregated world are given the same right to make art and to exist as other people. And it will also be like totally mold proof and uh, mildew proof and uh, will be maintained in a way so that if my friends who have compromised immune systems need emergency housing. It can also function as a space for emergency housing. It can actually sleep. Um, this turns into a king size bed and then there's actually two beds on a electric lift right here. So it can actually sleep quite a lot of people. And I just wanna give people solutions to uh, making space that is accessible in all of the environments in which we live. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to talk to me about it or uh, it's, I, I don't really like the idea of having to keep fighting for my needs to be met in um, anywhere. So I would just rather build it somewhere else um, and, you know, uh, make it happen because it hasn't been happening for me that for the nine years that I've lived in a wheelchair, no matter what amount of demand I make for spaces that claim to be inclusive and diverse, I cannot do anything to uh, get the accessibility or the accommodations I need. Uh, so yeah, that's this project. And then I will continue on with my sculpture life uh, once I can do that and make a disabled artist residency and hopefully uh, that will be interchangeable during the summer as a camp for disabled kids, um, like Crip Camp, in order to create the kind of like think tank idea I don't even like that word the type of um <laughs> the type of hub or the type of space that where we can empower each other to solve the problems that we face on a daily basis whether that's policy wise because there's still a lot of laws that need to be changed or whether that's physically or whether that's creatively um because I think there needs to be a space built for us because we don't really currently have have anywhere to connect and exist with each other and that's about it <laughs> sorry i know i'm intense but that's just the nature of these things uh, can we have a round of applause as, as it does or a um our reactions and um you know, uh, one of the things, first of all, just thank you so much. Uh, again, I, I'm Peter Lunenfeld. I'm, I'm uh, a professor in design media arts. And um, one of the ways that we're running these salons is to ask you to uh, send your questions into the chat and then we'll, we'll read them uh, to Emily and um, uh, I've already got one from, from Brandon. Um, it, what uh, Brandon says is, could you talk a little bit uh, about your use of social media? I've been listening to a lot of older artists bash Instagram, et cetera, lately, and can't help but feel like it's a bit condescending. Yeah, I mean, I do all of my work from bed. I do all of my planning, all of my, everything I do, I have you know, CRPS is the most painful disease in the world. I, it leaves me, you know, totally um, incapable of functioning in the way that other people are able to show up in space. It, I mean, I am very grateful for right now for not having an episode and I have to stay very calm and I have to eat right and I have to do everything right and I have to work out in order to be able to basically function in a, in a medium state of pain. Um, Instagram is not something that I ever thought I would have. I did not have one before I was disabled. Um, I was told by one of my first boyfriends after my accident, uh, 
I'm so glad you're not like, you don't make a big deal out of your disability on Instagram. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I found it to be a very, I kind of grew into using it as a tool for activism, but I kind of found it to be a very uh, rich place for dialogue. And I don't think a lot of people are using it in that way. Um, I think most people with disability rhetoric and any sort of inclusive, diverse rhetoric just use it to sell stuff or to pander to like capitalist notions of success that don't really um, solve the problems that we're facing. I don't think visibility really solves the problem that we're facing. Um, I think there's a lot of very visible disabled people on Instagram and there should be more and everyone should feel very empowered to being visible. Um, but I can't really show, I, I can't go out in space without a intense amount of labor and planning. Um, so most of my activism work is done from my, from my bed. That's my bed. It's done from in this room. Um, most of my artwork is made in this room. Um, everything I conceptualize is made in this room. I don't have the privilege of not using social media as a platform. Facebook is very Facebook has a lot of trolls and a lot of like very narrow minded people that aren't willing to like face the reality of things and change. There's a lot of like, um, I, you know, I'm from a family that is, that I am like very shocking to them. Um, there's kind of this, they think that there's a lot of people that don't want to solve problems or, um, see what truth is because it's painful. Truth is painful and it requires accountability and it requires us to do better. I mean, I'm not necess I don't believe that like niceness is a solution. I think nice people are often fake people. I think we need people who are down to take direct action and who are down to solve things head on um, and are not down to sugarcoat things. I am very positive. I have a very optimistic outlook on my life and I'm very grateful for what I have and for what I'm able to accomplish every day. But that does not mean that I think anyone else should have to experience what I've experienced. Um, even with the amount of privilege that I do have, it did, did not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't make any money. So uh, without that, you really can't have the sort of privilege that other disabled artists and disabled um, like models and stuff have had with like, without needing to be political, I'm very political in my Instagram and I'm able to be that way. It often gets me unfollowed, but you know, it's the only platform that I have. And even though I get shadow banned for things that I post, and even though um, that are just real, things that I post that are just the truth, um, it it is still a platform that enables me to change people's hearts about something. And that's really important. I'm able to, from my bed, change people's minds about are what we experience and humanize disabled people a little bit more or you know I'm not speaking for all disabled people ever everyone has different needs and needs to feel empowered in speaking about those needs and making the change um you know there's just so much ignorance and so much privilege wrapped up in having a body that functions and what society thinks is normal that there's just no consciousness outside of that and it needs to be made and I think that Instagram is a really great platform for me in that way because of the ease of use and I'm able to just I've gotten like I mean a lot of people make memes but what I'm trying to say is a lot lot deeper than um a lot I can't just be memed a lot of the time um but I, I don't know, I, I think it is kind of condescending because there are a lot of people that I know that use Instagram in a great way to advocate for themselves and who don't have the privilege of not doing so um, or being like the, you know, disabled people aren't, don't have the privilege of even really attending higher education um, or much less getting into office buildings without a, I, I mean, I just can't believe that that's what we all aspire to at the end of the day, not making the world like a more livable place or a better place for all of us that's filled with the things that we need, but like aspiring to an office job in which you're like probably discriminated at on a daily basis um, or any job for that matter, if you're not within um, the kind of norms that society has predicated on us. Um, and I, I think it, Instagram for me at least is like, 
a place where I'm able to really empower myself and other people because I also have to constantly tell myself that I deserve it, that I deserve these basic things and that I am worthy of these basic things and that we all are. Um, and yeah, if you're not leaving your bet, how are you going to make this change happen without, without something that, uh, uh, you know, a thousand and plus people can see and read easily and decide to think about maybe, um, that's a thousand, three hundred people that liked my most recent post that would have not known about that otherwise. And I know it because people message me and they're like, I had no idea. Or people come to my show and they're like, I'm disabled, but I didn't realize that this is what wheelchair users experience. Like this is so much more. And I'm like, you know, we all have these different stories and I, and I think it's very important that, um, we value them and that we uphold each other's needs. And I just, um, I really think that it is a privilege for people to say that social media and the internet is not the best place to be doing that. And it is sad because Instagram is usually just like people selling stuff to you or, um, selfies or like is very shallow, um, content wise because, or feel good. And, um, yeah, I, I like to challenge people and I still think that I can do that without getting too, too bashed on Instagram at least. Um, whereas Facebook is a little bit more, um, predicated on like the algorithms, norms, and like these kind of like outdated modes of, of thinking and existing. That was really long. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'd kind of like to combine two questions. One is from Evan Fusco and the other is from Callum Glennon and Clark. Evan uh, is talking about uh, your use of imagination almost as a language and imagining new spaces and then um, sort of how you're moving forward with that. And then Callum's question is, what do you think an, an accessible world would look like? Should design be fluid as opposed to normalized? In other words, would fluidity and design combat a normative approach to functionality? Yeah, I think rigidity is really, really a problem. I think standardization is really oppressive. I, I think the way in which industrialization and um, the ways in which we've commodified everything um, and made everything a profit margin instead of it working for people is really a problem. We have such a freaking mediocre world visually physically to experience i mean i want to create a crypt utopia i spend when i could without corona i spent my weekends at the huntington gardens due to a person from my instagram allowing me to like giving me free passes and shout out to them love them like i need to sit in the grass and it's like certain parts of that park are pretty accessible um, but yeah, I think we definitely do need a fluidity and we do need to not live in a world that um, makes it a cost, makes it cost prohibitive to have the fluidity of space that we need. I mean, this space doesn't look fluid, but the bed goes up and down on an electrical system. So no matter what height your wheelchair sits at, you can transfer to it no matter what height you are you can get onto the bed which is not something you can do with a fixed bed and there's there are these desi design solutions that exist and they're affordable and we just choose to do things the fastest because everyone you know i, I wouldn't be able to do this if i hired a contractor I wouldn't be able to do this if I just hired any architect. They have no consciousness for this type of thing. They have no conscious. And I think we need to give people who maybe aren't, you know, dedicated experts, the uh, ability to make these changes in these spaces. I mean, the reason I went with an RV too is because I can't afford the permits and the, and to get things coded in the state of California to build even in the middle of nowhere, even on the cheapest piece of property, I do not have the money to get the permits and the coding. It would cost more than this RV to do that for a 20 by 40 foot space for me. Um, if anyone knows how to solve that, please reach out. Um, but it's just very cost prohibit 
prohibitive to build these things. And I, I don't understand why we're not able to just demolish sidewalks that don't have curb cuts. Um, I don't understand the bureaucracy of making things um, exclusive to people um, or inaccessible. Uh, yeah, I think I think if we embrace embraced fluidity, I think, and if we demolished these binaries and these norms, we could live in an in a world that was just like a lot more beautiful and pleasant and um, and practical. Honestly, very practical. Um, another question was. How do you see the pandemic affecting the disability rights movement? That comes from Monica. Um, I think it's exhausting. I uh, think that I had a lot more hope uh, for this bringing people together than what I've experienced. Um, I still see disabled and chronically ill people dealing with the worst um, uh, kind of realities in general um, due to this pandemic. Like I said, uh, people in group homes and the elderly um, and people who are in inst who are institutionalized have faced, you know, the highest death rates. Um, I think that disability advocates have fought the, like, I don't know, I created a mutual aid group that was very fluid with the help of, of, of friends, including Natalie. Um, to get, I was just on the fly trying to get medications to people, trying to get money for medications, trying to take resources and get them to people who needed it, um, trying to get people mobility devices who needed it. Um, and I've found though that people, I've found that the people who have still been doing the most amount of work, who are still the least able to but need it the most, are still the ones advocating and doing the work for other people like them. And so I would like to challenge people with more privilege to step up and to recognize and be grateful for what they do have, not because our lives are sad, but because we do need help. Um, and, you know, it, it um, yeah, I think disability rights advocates, and I mean really advocates, I don't mean like the, I don't mean most people who do like disability visibility on Instagram. I don't, I, there are, we should all listen to disabled people, but not all disabled people should be our leaders. Um, I would, uh, I would really uh, start to recognize who is doing the work so that able-bodied people um, can support those who are doing the work right now um and like i don't know what happened but uh but a very important figure in my life stacy milburn died yesterday and i'm like devastated um and up until her death she was doing like intense advocacy work um she's a disability rights advocate and uh um yeah i don't know i thought maybe it would i was I was hoping that maybe it would really get able-bodied people on our side or more or recognizing the needs that we've had. But what I've just come up against is like a mass anxiety and a mass fear from people who aren't willing to face things. Um, and I've just seen disabled people struggle to take care of themselves and their friends at the same time in the same, in the same way that we always have been. Um, and so I would like that to change because I'm very tired right now. and. And yeah, it, I burn out every now and again in it for like a day, but then I don't feel like I have the ability to ever stop because I don't have the privilege to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm always trying to, I'm always trying to make things happen. And I see the people who are making things happen the most are the ones that also need the most help themselves. And so I would like those, those things to flip and to change and for people who have privilege to feel more empowered and to feel um, more capable of giving others like what they need in whatever ways in which they need that. I, uh, I can't even find people willing to do bowel and bladder for um, caregiving for people who need it, who want jobs, but for some reason, like we can't normalize taking care of other people like that, even though it's a bodily function. Um, 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm tired, <laughs> but I have to build this and I have to build a lot of things. So I kind of have to get over it. Um, I wanted to combine two more questions again. Um, and, and I think this will probably be the last, uh, last question. And it's a pretty big one, actually. Um, Ashley, uh, Maurice writes, Emily, thank you for sharing such deeply personal experiences and how it shapes your work. You mentioned visiting other countries. Are there any examples you could share that model best practices to support accessible design? What do you think is the most crucial aspects of universal design we need to start implementing in this country? And then um, I'd like to link that to an even more specific question from Ivana Damjanovic. Uh, can you share your thoughts on robots like Orihime D made in Japan to help people with disability? In other words, do you think that advancements in AI will change the lives of disabled people? So it's a general question about like best practices globally and then um, what you'd like to see as best practices perhaps with AI and robotics and, and, and is it something we should be thinking about? I think that people need to learn how to take care of each other. Um, I don't think AI will solve the the issues that disabled people face on a daily basis because it takes um it takes intimacy and i don't think ai will be able to create that physical intimacy with disabled people to anticipate our needs and the ways in which good caregivers can um uh, or good friends can i don't think ai will ever be capable of meeting disabled people's needs because they are it's so it's so different. You wouldn't be able to make one robot for all disabled people. There's so many different factors and there's so many accidents that could happen that require like, um, you know, present, being disabled is very present. You're very present all the time and you have to bring that presentness into able-bodied people that you're around. You kind of have to force able-bodied people to be more present with their bodies and with space. And I don't think AI will be able to solve those problems at all as someone who needs a caregiver and sees and who I also am a caregiver for other people who who need it as well and even though I may not have the physical capability of able-bodied people because I've experienced that level of of injury before I can I would believe even more safely and easily take care of other people with spinal cord injuries despite my own physical disabilities just because it's not hard it's 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 uh it's the way you do something and how you do something and it's a it's um it's it's there's so much fear that people that people have about um being you know careful and caring for others and uh i don't think ai will solve it i think that um no country has really done a super great job at accessibility but america is by far one of the worst um other countries like amsterdam even though the bathrooms are bad um has sidewalks that are like this big which means i can pop up them very easily i can get onto the sidewalks whereas in the u.s i'm forced to ride down the middle of the street to get to the one curb cut on in 100 feet um, and risk my life doing so. When I had a car, I was opening my car to unload my wheelchair and put it together next to my car. And I would have to ride down the street to get to my doctor's office, to get to my therapist appointment. Um, it is inhumane and it is scary. And I've almost been hit by a car many times. Crossing the street, I have hit a hole while it was raining and went flying out of my chair and the light turned green and thankfully people stopped and got me back into my chair because that was in a time at which I did not have the strength to crawl and get myself back into my chair. Um, I think Japan and Asia have a much better um, consciousness, China even, about disability. They have implemented lifts in their public transit so that disabled people can use the trains, whereas in the US we are not able to use the trains most um, public transit is not public. It is uh, catering to able-bodied people, um, people who can use the stairs. Um, lots of, you know, a woman and a woman, a mother died getting her baby stroller um, up the stairs of the New York transit system. Um, this isn't just affecting me. A woman died being carried by her new, like her fiance, or she was just her newlywed husband 
was carrying her and she was drunk and he tripped in a in a bad broken sidewalk and she died like this isn't this isn't this making things accessible for disabled people will only make everyone else safer um, and make it easier for everyone else to exist um, but i don't think any country is uh i mean japan you're able to work as a disabled person and still receive caregiving there's not such brutal austerity measures that force you into poverty i would really highly suggest reading um trapped in america's safety net one family struggle um it's a very good book that talks about a little bit of what i deal with too of like a middle class family of a of a woman who's newly paralyzed with a baby and her family's experience with austerity in this country um and i would suggest reading health justice now because people you know even people who are disabled with some sort of financial security are still not able to ensure that care shows up every day to get them out of bed or help them get dressed and that is a problem that we don't have that and not many i think japan does a better job i've seen it like I know that it's a little better in Japan because I know a lot of disabled people that have moved to Japan um, because there is a better understanding and they care more about people <laughs> with disabilities there. Um, but I wouldn't say that any country is quite like is like amazing at all. Like it just doesn't exist. So I think we have to build it no matter where we're at. And I don't think AI will get it to us, and I don't think technology will have either. I think right now today we need to be more present with solving these problems in what ways we can. And I don't like taking, you know, there's so many excuses that able-bodied people use, but I do a lot from my room, from my bed in a shit ton of pain um, and unable to get the medical treatment I need and without the wheelchair I need. And yeah, I think there needs to be more accountability you know, we need to do better. I've had to force myself to do better. I deal with my own internalized ableism every day. Um, we all need to deal with the ways in which are uh, the ways in which we have been affected by society's norms and like oppressive ideas, um, especially in a country based off of like, you know, eugenics, genocide, slavery, um, colonialization, imperialism. A lot of things that we need to face and address and change uh, and stop being so scared of. I mean, we only live for so long. Why aren't we making things better? Why are we allowing people to make trillions of dollars um, while most people go without being able to pay their rent? I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. I really, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was very idealistic and I thought that I was being, you know, born into a world that made sense and it doesn't and i'm still kind of that kid that is just like why doesn't this make sense well thank you so much i'm gonna unmute everybody so if, if we could just show a little appreciation <laughs> thank you Yay! thank you risk bombing thank you. to um <laughs> to, to give appreciation. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody. Uh, well, I, I, I think with that, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, you know, again, uh, thanks so much for Natalie Decker's uh, uh, decision to invite. Um, uh -huh. And, and, and uh, I'll be closing with that. I, I will send... Um, Emily, the, 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 the transcript no plot, yeah. uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the chat so that you get people's comments because we didn't get a chance to do everything. And once again, um, all of our thanks. Um, great. So, Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Bye.